Well, good evening once again, brethren. It is very nice to uh, see you here this evening, uh, to be back with you. You know, uh, just recently, just a matter of uh, earlier this week, uh, there were quite a bit of celebrations going on in Louisiana. In fact, if, if you wanted to do business in Louisiana, uh, Monday, Tuesday of this past week would not have been a good time uh, to come to South Louisiana trying to do business. Uh, the reason, of course, was because they were celebrating Mardi Gras. Fat Tuesday. And uh, celebrating is almost an understatement because uh, particularly in New Orleans, they, they go all out. Uh, they shut down. In New Orleans, they shut down school for the whole week. Uh, Baton Rouge, they don't, they're not quite as strong. Uh, they only shut it down for a couple of days. You get on further into Cajun country, and they shut it down for three days. And New Orleans just forgets about it for, uh, for the whole week. But, uh, you know... In the aftermath of that, in the aftermath of Mardi Gras, which was on Tuesday, uh, there were a number of people who showed up uh, at school, at uh, university, uh, at work, and they had a little smear of ashes on their forehead. Now, the reason, of course, was they had gone in uh, for the early morning service there at the Catholic Church. Uh, They were participating in Ash Wednesday. They were entering a time of Lent, a time of fasting and penance. Now, they call it fasting. Uh, In reality, they mean giving up something. Uh, Some may be quite devout and uh, give up, uh, you know, various things. Some give up uh, red meat and only eat uh, seafood during uh, during that time. I went to school with a fellow that uh, was not quite as devout as as that. He uh, normally gave up watermelon for Lent, (laughs) which didn't represent a real sacrifice on his part since it wasn't very readily available at that time of year anyway. Uh, but anyway, that was what he gave up for Lent. So uh, uh, he was uh, not one of the more devout Catholics that I've known. Uh, but the point is, the, the whole concept of what is described there in preparation, this 40 days, of course, leads up to uh, the time of, uh, uh, of Easter. Now, when you look at it, you, you look at, at what precedes it. They call it carnival uh, some places down in uh, Brazil and other places. They call it carnival. South Louisiana, they, they call it Mardi Gras. Uh, The concept of sin is that sin is all the stuff that's fun. Sin is the good times, the exciting things. Sin is all the stuff you want to do. And, of course, God doesn't like people to have fun. God wants them to, you know, sort of look sad somehow, look like they've been kicked in the stomach and had ashes smeared on their head. So if they're going to have to do that, the thing to do is just really go out and tie one on so that by Wednesday morning... Your mouth probably tastes like ashes, uh, and you might as well go ahead and have a few smeared on your forehead. Now, this is the, it's, it's a concept, an attitude towards sin. And you see, it's the world's attitude towards sin, that sin is the good stuff, but God doesn't want you to have fun. And so, you go out and you really tie one on, but then you walk softly for a little while and sort of appease God's anger, because when He sees uh, that you're really... Uh, uh, sort of stepping softly for a little while. He'll sort of let up and forget about all the stuff you did, uh, you know, leading up to Lent. Now, that whole concept of penance is a pagan concept. It's not what the Scriptures teach, though you may be unaware that the Bible does make reference to Lent. Uh, you won't find it in the New Testament, but you do find a reference back in the Old. Uh, it's uh, described back in Ezekiel 8. In Ezekiel 8 and verse 12, he said unto me, Son of man, have you seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the chambers of his imagery. Now he's talking about the house of Israel. He says what they do in the dark. Have you ever noticed that people somehow feel emboldened to do things in the dark that they wouldn't necessarily want to do in the bright light of sun, out in the noonday sun, you know, standing out in the open? Oh, they wouldn't do that. It's as though, you know... God sees just as well in the dark. His night vision is real good. Just because you do it in the dark doesn't mean He won't find out about it. That's sort of the attitude people seem to have. You know, they can get down there, Mardi Gras, and they can put a mask on, and they can really uh, kick it up and do all kinds of stuff. And there's a certain anonymity. Nobody's going to know. Well, the one who counts knows. His night vision is quite good. He sees what people do in the dark. So he talks about abominations that are practiced. In verse 13, he says, Turn again, and you'll see greater abominations that they do. And he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And there sat women weeping for Tammuz. 
Now, if you check that up, you find that Tammuz was the savior god of the Babylonian mystery religion. He was the son of Easter, or Ishtar. And in the period of weeks leading up to the holiday, to the festival of Easter, or Ishtar, there was this period of penance, this period of lamenting for Tammuz. And then there was the celebration that is described right next in verse 15 of even greater abominations. In verse 16, he brought me into the inner house, the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple, between the porch and the altar, were about twenty-five men with their backs toward the temple and their faces toward the east, and they worship the sun toward the east. Now, that's a sunrise service. That's when the sun is in the east. If you're going to look in the east to see the sun, or you're going to worship the sun in the east, then you're having a sunrise service. So this was the culmination. You start, it started out with the, the period of, of Lent, the weeping for Tammuz, as it was called uh, in the ancient uh, Middle East, and then the celebration of the festival of Ishtar, or Easter, as they were holding this sunrise service. So a lot of these customs, a lot of these ideas go way, way back. Now, it's not my purpose to focus in primarily here this evening on the, the pagan festivities and on proving these things are pagan. I think we've gone through that. You know, we're coming up to God's spring festival season. And in just a matter of weeks, a little over a month from now, we are going to be meeting to observe the Passover and then the Days of Unleavened Bread. Now, we don't lead up to that period of time by going through a period of penance. We're told that we are to examine ourselves, certainly, but God presents for His people a way of life. And the difference in our approach and the world's approach is very much tied in with the biblical understanding of what is sin. Because when we understand that God is, in, is, is interested in developing in us His character, His nature, God is preparing us for an inheritance. And when we understand what sin is, when we understand the awfulness of sin and the consequences that it brings, then we realize sin isn't a joke. It's not something to go out and really tie one on and then sort of go through the motions of being good and smear little ashes on and go through the motions. Now, the Apostle Paul explains in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14, he says, For the love of Christ constrains us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they should live not henceforth unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Now, Paul explains here that one died for all. You see, brethren, something that's very fundamental. You and I cannot atone for our sin. We don't have the power. It's not a matter of sort of going out and doing something to make up for it. You and I can't atone for our sins. If we could, the sacrifice of Christ was in vain. Now, many of the Jews had the, the concept of they had taken the, what are termed the works of the law many of the rituals and the things that were connected with the Levitical system. And in the minds of some, they had transformed it almost into a matter of penance. The idea that you do these rituals and that gains you access to God. And they did not understand, or many had lost sight of the fact, that the rituals were symbolic, but they, are not, they did not gain you access to God. The only way we gain access to God is through Jesus Christ. One died for all. He took our place. That was you and that was me that deserved to be hanging up there. Because you see, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. We're told in, in the book of Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Now, you know, there's some folks that seem to think the curse of the law is that you've got to keep it. Oh, he's redeemed us from the curse of the law. Well, what does that mean? You, you know, is it a real curse? You can't shoot people? You can't go out and murder people? Oh, boy, you know, the law is really a heavy burden. 
I can't go murder anybody today. I've got to quit robbing 7-Elevens. Uh, you know, I uh, can't go and hold up the bank because that old law. Oh, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Now we can go out and, and uh, you know, rob three stores before breakfast. That's ridiculous. I mean, that's, that's ludicrous. The idea, well, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law is keeping the law, the curse. Actually, if you really nail them down, see, all the people who tell you the law was done away, Ten Commandments were nailed to the cross. And you say, well, look, uh, as I did one time, I remember an Assembly of God preacher that I was uh, talking to. I, I had come to visit New Perspective members, and I think they went to his church. He had heard about it, so he was over there to see me uh, at the time. And he told me, he says, the law's done away. I said, good. I said, you've got a nice new car sitting out there. Uh, it's a lot nicer and newer than mine. Uh, how about if I just go steal your car? And uh, if you try to stop me, I'll shoot you. And everybody asks me about it, I'll lie. Because the law's been nailed to the cross, and so that would be okay, and God wouldn't mind, would not Well, he didn't think those had been nailed up there. <laughs> he, none of the three of those things struck him as a real good idea. Actually, what it really came down to is evidently, God, you know, He did pretty well. He got nine out of ten right. The only one He missed on was the fourth one. He got the wrong day. But you know, 90%, that's pretty good on a test. It may, may not be an A, but it'll, it's a good pass. You know, God doesn't need to feel badly about it. He, he did okay. You know, that's, that's ridiculous. It's the only commandment that God says remember, and that's the one people want to forget. That ought to tell, that ought to tell them something. I mean, it's... it's, it's Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. What does that mean? Well, according to the rest of the verse here, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. Oh, the curse of the law is being taken out and executed. Go back to Deuteronomy. Let me, let me show you something back here. We will find where the, we'll find the curse of the law back in Deuteronomy 21. Deuteronomy 21, verse 22. Here's where Paul was quoting from. Actually, quoted from verse 23. We'll see it when we get there. Deuteronomy 21, 22. If a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and be put to death, and you shall hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but you shall in any wise bury him that day. For he that hangs is accursed of God, that they your land shall not be defiled, that the Lord has given you for an inheritance. You know, they didn't have it so wrong in the Old West. Uh, you know, somebody was convicted, convicted of a capital crime, they took them out there and they hung them on a tree. And then they cut them down and buried them in Boot Hill. And, uh, you know, when that, was, when that was consistently done, it did wonders for the crime way. That's the curse. The curse is the death penalty. If you don't keep the law, God says if you commit a sin worthy of death, then you're going to be taken out and hung on a tree. You're going to die and you're going to be cut down and gone and buried. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that's hung on a tree. You see, He took your place and mine because sin is the transgression of the law. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 Romans 6.23 tells us the wages of sin is death. Sin is the transgression of the law. All have sinned and the wages of sin is death. The curse of the law is the death penalty on those who break the law. You turn on over in Deuteronomy in verse chapter 27, verse 20, uh, 26, it says, Cursed be he that confirms not all the words of this law to do them. The curse of the law is upon the disobedient. And that's a category that has included every one of us in every human being. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. The curse of the law is not that you have to obey the law. The curse of the law is the death penalty upon the disobedient. Christ took our place. So the love of Christ constrains us, Paul writes. If one died for all, then we're all dead. One died for all. Now how can one die and pay the penalty for everyone? Well, you have to understand who that one was. We're told in John chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and He was God. 
We're told on down in verse 14, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. So here was the Word, the One who existed from eternity in power and glory with the One that we know as the Father. He was with God with God the Father, and He also was God. And the Word became flesh. He emptied Himself of that power and that glory that He had shared with the Father from eternity. And He took upon Himself the nature of the seed of Abraham. He became a human being. He became a partaker in flesh. You know, in one of the final prayers we have recorded, that Jesus prayed to the Father the night prior to His crucifixion, He said in John chapter 17 and verse 5, Now, O Father, glorify you me with your own self, with the glory that I had with you before the world was. The glory that Christ had shared, He had emptied Himself voluntarily of that glory to become a human being, to be born of the Virgin Mary. Because He came forth, grew up, He preached, he taught for three and a half years. He was taken out, arrested, convicted, executed. But then three and a half, three days and three nights later, he came forth. Came forth from the grave, never to die again. One died for all. The one who made our first parents, who knelt down and, and made Adam from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living soul. The one that took a rib out from Adam and made a woman. The one who was the Creator. Without Him was not anything made that was made. That's what we're told. He was in the beginning with God. He was God. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. This great being, existing in resplendent light and power and glory and majesty, emptied Himself. He emptied Himself of all of that and was born as a little tiny baby. And he grew up, and he came then to announce a message. He came as the messenger of the covenant. He came with the gospel of the kingdom of God. And he died to take our place. That was prophesied back in Isaiah 53. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, and he was bruised for our iniquities. With the chastisement of his peace, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we're healed. We're told in the end of verse 8, that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people was he stricken. We're told in the end of verse 12 that he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. He took our place, yours and mine. In Romans chapter 5, in verse 6, when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commends His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He took our place. One died for all. One died for all. Does that mean that it doesn't matter how we live anymore? He took our, He died for us, and so we can you know, continue in sin that grace may abound. To repent is to turn from sin. It's to turn from the way of sin. It's not simply to, to give up something, to do penance. There is a vast difference between penance and repentance. To repent is a biblical term, and it means to turn away or to turn from. It, has the, it, it, it involves turning from sin toward God, a change of direction in our life. Penance is simply trying to do some good deeds, trying to punish yourself in some way to make up for what you've done that's bad. And that is a a false concept. Paul explains in Romans chapter 6 and verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? You know, people talk about, well, law law or grace. You know, we believe in grace. We, We don't believe in that old law. Well, the Bible teaches law and grace. 
If all the Bible taught was law, then you and I are all as good as dead because that's what we earn. We've all sinned, and the wages of sin is death. So we can line up at the pay office and collect our slip. Grace is something freely given. So what God offers us is a chance to not get what's coming to us. And that's made possible because someone took our place. The one whose life was worth more than the sum total of all human lives added together. The one who said, let there be light, and there was light. The one who breathed into Adam the breath of, the breath of life, and Adam became a living soul. That one emptied himself, divested himself. That one took our place. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Don't you know that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? We symbolically shared in that death. We went down into a watery grave. Therefore, we're buried with Him by baptism into death. Like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now, there's some who seem to think that you know, Christ and the Father were the same one, and Christ resurrected Himself. Well, that's not what it says right here. He says He was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father because He was dead. And He was dependent upon the Father to restore Him to that life and that glory that He and the Father had shared together from eternity. So we're baptized into His death, and we're buried symbolically. He was raised from the dead. And even so, when we come up out of that watery grave, we're to walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of His death, we shall be also in the likeness of His resurrection. Baptism is symbolic of a death, burial, and resurrection. So we know that our old man is crucified with Him, that the body of death, the body of sin might be destroyed, that we should, henceforth we should not serve sin. Sin has had a hold on us. Christ died in our stead, and we symbolically participate in that death when we go under the waters of baptism. We are accepting that death. We are going into a watery grave. And as we come back out, we look forward to, we anticipate through faith the resurrection. We believe that Christ died for us, but that He came forth in life, and that we might also participate in that life. You see, Paul tells us back in 2 Corinthians once again, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, He died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto Him which died for them and rose again. So we are to live not a selfish, self-centered, self-focused life. We're to not henceforth live unto ourselves, but we're to live to Him. There is a new way of living. We're told in Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of Man who loved me, who gave Himself for me. We have a new basis of living back in, in the book of Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3.1 If you then be risen with Christ, you've come up out of that watery grave. You've been, you are risen with Christ. Seek those things which are above where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. If we've come up out of the watery grave and we have faith and confidence, we are looking forward with anticipation, with eagerness, with desire to share an eternal life with Christ and the Father. Then we're told that we need to set our affection on things above, not on things on the earth. The things here and now are going to pass away. They're not going to endure forever. If we anticipate being part of something that will endure, that will last forever, then we need to set our affections on what will last forever. We need to set our affection on that, not on the things that are going to pass. So he says, you're dead. Your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall you also appear with Him in glory. We'll share in that glory. We are to live for Him. On over in 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, we pick it up in verse 9. It says, you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. We're not to fit in with the world. We're not to be just like everyone else. 
it ought to be pretty obvious where the world stops and the church of God starts. A peculiar people, a holy nation. We're to show forth the praises of Him who has called us out of the darkness and into His marvelous light. We are to reflect praise to God by our conduct. So he says in verse 11, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. We're told to have our conduct honest. Coming on down a little further, he says in verse 20, What glory is it if you be buffeted, if when you're buffeted for your faults, you take it patiently? You know, most of us feel like if we got in trouble for something we deserved and we took it in a fairly decent attitude, that that really ought to count for something. He says, what glory is it if, you're buff- if when you're buffeted for your faults, you take it patiently? This is what counts to God. If when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently. This is acceptable unto God. Now, you talk about something hard to do. It's hard enough to take it when you know you have it coming. When you know you didn't have it coming. Now, you talk about being hard to take it patiently. To take being treated unfairly. Well, the next time you're treated unfairly, Just think about the fact that Christ was treated pretty unfairly. He was treated unfairly for our sake. And if we have to go through a little taste here and now, here and then, of some of what He went through far greater, then let's try to go through our trials the way He went through His. See, verse 19 tells us here in 1 Peter 2, This is thankworthy. If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully, If because you obey God and you're committed to serving Him and to walking with Him, if because of obedience you suffer wrongfully, enduring grief, that counts for something. For even, verse 21, even hereunto were you called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example you should follow in His steps. He didn't call on us just to do penance once a year. He didn't call on us to get ashes smeared on our head. He called on us to follow a way of life, day in, day out. He set us an example that we should follow in His steps. We're to be His disciples. Brethren, God's grace is freely given. But don't ever, ever confuse free with cheap. There's a vast difference. God freely extends to us what you and I could never earn, buy, or deserve. His mercy, His forgiveness. But it didn't come cheap. The price was the life of Jesus Christ. He paid that price. He paid it for you and He paid it for me. We have a responsibility to consider that. Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example. You should follow in His steps. Let's go on. In 2 Corinthians 5, Paul went on to say that our knowledge of Christ and of what He did and said is not simply limited to fleshly estimates. He says in verse 16 of 2 Corinthians 5, Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we've known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Not that way. Our, our knowledge of Christ, uh, our knowledge is not limited to what we can just figure out based on fleshly estimates, based on what things uh, appear. It's based on spiritual knowledge. You know, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 1.26, You see your calling, brethren, now that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty or noble have been called. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound that which is mighty. The base, the things which are despised as God chosen, yes, and the things which are not to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in His presence. Jeremiah explains... Back in Jeremiah chapter 9, in verse 23, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches. That's the things people take pride about, what they know, uh, how strong they are, how smart they are, how much money they have. These are the things people take pride in, confidence in. Jeremiah says, Let, not, let him that glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight. That's the thing to take confidence in. See, he goes on and says in chapter 10 and verse 23, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man that walks to direct his steps. Our knowledge, our understanding is not limited to fleshly estimates. 
it's based on what God shows and what God reveals. Paul went on to explain in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We're a new creature. We're not continuing to live the way we used to live. We turn back to Colossians. Let's notice. Colossians 3. Colossians 3 and verse 10. You put on the new man, which is, create, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. A new person. There's a renewal that's taken place. So we're told in verse 12, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. And above all these, love. Verse 14, which is the bond of perfectness. Then notice in verse 18, he begins to get specific. He tells us in verse 17, Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Verse 18, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands, as is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, be not better against them. Children, obey your parents in all things. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Continuing on, chapter 4, verse 1. Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal. When we become a new creature, relationships are transformed. In our home, on the job, husbands, wives, parents, children, employees, employers, relationships are transformed. There is a difference because we're talking about being a new creature. You know, Christ talked about hypocrisy. We read and we're familiar with it. Talk to the scribes, the Pharisees. He told them they were hypocrites. What we don't often get as we read that is the full impact of what hypocrite meant in that first century setting. Hypocrite is a Greek word and means an actor, an actor on the stage. Now, Greek drama was very famous. The Greeks were noted for their, their, their great playwrights, their great dramatists. And in, in throughout the Middle East, there were places where Greek drama and theater was performed. And people went and they saw it, and this was quite famous. One of the things about Greek drama was the actors on the Greek stage wore masks. We see today stylized versions of those masks. Uh, just about any time you look at something uh, on a particularly like a college uh, theater or something like that, you see the two stylized masks representing tragedy and comedy. You know, one with the upturned smile, uh, the, 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 the mask of comedy, the other with the downturned uh, mouth, the, the, the mask of tragedy. Now, these, these masks, these stylized masks that we see today uh, in logos, and uh, in fact, it's funny, uh, I noticed last week uh, there in Lafayette, and in the, in the, we meet in the school auditorium, they had their Mardi Gras stuff hung up, and they had a copy, they had the masks back there. The, uh, the, the masks of tragedy and comedy were hung up. You see, to be an actor on the Greek stage was to wear a mask. Back behind the stage, before you came out on public view, in public view, you put on a mask. And you walked on the, onto the stage, you walked into public view, and you spouted your lines. You said the things that you were to say. You said your lines and you went back behind the stage and you took your mask off. When Christ called people hypocrites, what He was telling them and what the Word meant was your actors on a stage. You put on a mask and you recite your line. And when you walk out of public view, off comes the mask. You're participating in an illusion. You're reciting lines. You're, you're wearing a public mask. That's not the way you really are. Christ has called us not simply to put on a public mask. You know, if we walk out of church services. You walk out of church services, get in your car, and you take the mask off. And the way you talk to your husband or your wife or your children is something different then you're wearing a mask. What God calls us to do is not simply to put on a mask, come up here in front of one another, and recite our lines wearing the mask. Walk off the stage, take off the mask, and be some other way. To be a new creature in Christ will transform relationships. It will carry over in our homes and on our jobs. It means that we're trying to live a new way of life. And if we are, it'll have its impact on our relationship with those with whom we're closest. 
Our husbands, our wives, our parents, our children, our employees, our employers. Day-by-day relationships. What God calls us to do is not to perform a little bit of penance, not to smear ashes on our forehead, not to put on a mask and recite our lines. What He calls upon us to do is to become a new creation, a new creature, to recognize that one died for all, therefore are all dead. We went under that waters of baptism. We accepted the death of Christ in our stead. And we come up intent on living a new way of life. Paul goes on to explain in 2 Corinthians 5. In verse 18, all things are of God, and He's given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To it that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself not imbuing their trespasses unto them, and He's committed unto us the word of reconciliation. To be reconciled means to be brought into harmony. God is in the process, made possible our being brought into harmony with Him. He reconciled us to Himself in Jesus Christ. And the message, the gospel of the kingdom of God, is a message of reconciliation. It is a message of how the world can become reconciled to God. Now, you have to know where God is if you're going... To be reconciled means to be brought into harmony with. You know, you get a state, you get your bank statement from the bank and you sit down to reconcile your checkbook. That means you're trying to bring your checkbook into harmony with the statement. And if there's a difference, you've got to see. You've got to, you've got to see what they say and what, how you're different. You've got to know so that you can bring it into harmony. The message of reconciliation means it certainly includes the message of God's law because if we're going to be reconciled, if we're going to be brought into harmony with God, we've got to know what God stands for. You see, by the law is the knowledge of sin. Paul explained that in the book of Romans. He said, I wouldn't have known uh, lust, for instance, except the law says you shall not covet. That's what he uh, says back in Romans chapter 7 and verse 7. He said, I wouldn't have known sin but for the law. How do you know right from wrong unless you've got a standard that defines it? Paul said, how how would I know that I shouldn't lust? Except the law says you shall not covet. Now, which law says that? That sort of sounds like the Ten Commandments. Evidently, Paul didn't know that had all been nailed to the cross. By the law is the knowledge of sin. To be reconciled to God means involves several things. It involves, number one, you've got to know what God stands for and see how what you stand for has been different than what God stands for. You've got to know the difference between sin and righteousness. And the law defines that. Then you've got to know how your account has been marked paid in full. How your bond of debt has been erased. That's through the sacrifice of Christ. Because you see, ultimately, the whole world is to be brought in harmony with God. The kingdoms of this world are going to become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever. We have a message of reconciliation. The gospel of the kingdom of God is a message about how the whole world is ultimately going to be in harmony with God and how we can become in harmony with God. So He's committed to us the word of reconciliation. Reconciliation with God. God's the one who initiated it. God took the first step. It is our responsibility to respond to that first step. You know, James says in James 4.4, You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever will be the friend of God, the friend of the world, is the enemy of God. You can't fit in with the world and fit in with God. We're called upon to reject the wrong and to choose the right. It's not enough just to sort of go with the flow and do what's right if you're surrounded by others who are doing what's right. God wants us to reject what is wrong. To reject sin. To be brought into harmony with Him. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. We can't be part of the value. That doesn't mean that you're unkind to people in the world. God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. It's not a matter of of animosity or holier than thou toward people. It's a matter of values and standards the ways of this society that are corrupt and that are decadent. We reject them. We want to be in harmony with God. So Paul goes on to tell us here in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 20, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. We're representatives. We're emissaries of a soon-coming kingdom. 
of a government. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. Walk in harmony with Him. Yield to Him. Strive to become compatible with God in every way. For He has made Him to be sin for us. Jesus Christ, the Word, the One who was in the beginning with God, the One who was God, the One who became flesh. He made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. God's purpose and destiny is to transform us, to make us into something we never were, to transform us into righteousness, to build and to develop His holy, righteous character within us. You know, the world doesn't understand that. They don't understand what salvation is all about. They don't understand why we're saved, what we're saved for, or what we're saved from. I think they're just going to go off to heaven, you know, just sort of float off to heaven and just roll around heaven all day long like the old song. Just going to roll around heaven. We're going to sit on the cloud and strum the harp a few times, flap their wings a little bit, shine up the halo, you know, not, not a whole lot to do up there. Well, if that's the destiny, if that's all there is, then I don't guess there's anything you need to do other than just sort of believe, and maybe you wouldn't even necessarily have to do that. Well, James says, you believe there's one God, you do well. The demons also believe and tremble. You believe in God, you're not even one step up on the devil. He does that. You're going to have to do something to get at least a step up on the devil because uh, if you're not doing any better than he is, well, then why would you expect to uh, you know, be any place other than where he is? The kind of faith the Bible talks about is living faith. Living faith results in action. If you believe something, you'll act on it. And I can tell you I believe in something all day long, and if I don't act on it, I obviously don't believe it very much. We're called to exemplify living faith. He made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin. He wasn't there because of what He had done. He was there because of what you and I have done. He made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. God is transforming and changing us that we might ultimately participate in His family on into eternity, forever. You see, we're being changed. We're being transformed. We're told, 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, Herein is our love made perfect, brought to completion, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. How can you have boldness in the day of judgment? Because as He is, so are we in this world. We're seeking to live our lives in this world as Christ does, allowing Him to live in us. Well, brethren, as we approach the Passover season, we need to understand the awfulness of sin and the enormity of God's love. We need to understand that God has a plan and a purpose for us that will culminate in our sharing life with Him as a part of His family on into eternity. And when we really get the big picture, all the little stuff here and now, all the things we go through and the ups and downs and, and discouragements and encouragements and, and, and uh, the good things and the bad things and the frustrations and all the little petty things of day-to-day -day life, they all get put in perspective. And we realize that the sufferings of this present time are nothing by comparison to the glory that shall be revealed in us. The glory that shall be revealed in us. Because we're told on down here, let's conclude in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 16, What agreement is the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I'll dwell in them and walk in them, and I'll be their God and they'll be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be you separate, says the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. We've got to realize that we've been called out of the world. We've been called to exemplify a way that is coming. Ambassadors of the kingdom of God. Come out from among them. Be separate. Be distinct. Maintain our identity as the people of God. God says in verse 18, I'll be a father unto you and you'll be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Having therefore these promises, continuing on the next verse, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Going on to completion. 
to becoming like God. God has called us to participate in His life, in His glory. He's called us to His kingdom and His glory. God is reproducing Himself. Jesus Christ came to be made sin for us, Him who knew no sin that we may be made the righteousness of God in us. God is transforming us. Brethren, we need to clearly understand what the Bible teaches in this regard. The world's holidays come and go. The things that we participate in, the festivals of God, point us to the plan and to the purpose that God is working out. We must never ever treat it cheaply, carelessly, or casually, but to value it, to love the truth, to love God's way, to move forward, perfecting holiness in the fear of God, walking in reverence and awe of God, striving to become like Him. He's the one who made it possible, and He's in the process of bringing us into harmony with Him that we may be like Him, that we may share life with Him on into eternity.